Hello everyone, today I'm going to be doing another deck profile, this time on another Card by Vanguard deck profile, but I haven't done one of these for a while. This time on my Luard Ritual Premium deck. Post the premium ban list. Yes, I already know it's like three weeks for this video to be released, but considering that Bendy got banned, my Phantom Blaster Dragon deck has been hit. So I decided to just replace my Phantom Blaster Premium deck to a Luar deck. Because if I can't play that effectively, then it's no fun. So this is now my new replacement for my Shadow Paladin Premium deck. Luar Ritual it is. And considering with Revival Collection, I kind of had an excuse because of those cheap reprints. So why not? And I'm going to be very honest, most of these cards are actually not too expensive. At most, it's the strides. But on that, let's begin with how the deck functions. So first off, you have no gift markers, so keep that in mind. The second thing is that you do not want to really go first with this deck. This is a going second deck because you're going to be focusing on striding, which I call drag shift. And three, you want to build your grade ones in your drop zone because the more grade ones you got, the stronger you get. And that's how the ritual mechanic works. At least three, so you could get most of your abilities off. But the more grade ones in your drop zone, the more ritual count that you get. So that's basically what it is. But on that, let's begin. So we start off with the main deck, and of course, our grade three lineup. This is gonna be the only grade three in the deck, which is Dragfall Luard. So what Dragfall Luard does is Ritual Cross, Counter Blast four, return one card to the bottom of the deck from your drop zone, and then stride whatever you want. And that includes ultimate stride. But you decrease it by one counter for every grade one in your drop zone. That's one of the reasons why you want to build those grade ones in the drop zone. It's because you want to prepare for the drag shift. Now in most cases, you will be able to just get the drag shift for free with the first skill, no problem. At most, it's just one counter blast. But anyway, to the second skill, stride skill. You can counter blast one, call one grade one from your deck. If it's a ritual card, kill one card in the same column as the as the called unit. So it also has a retire option as well. Unlike the original drag heart, now there is benefits to run the original drag heart where the original drag heart returns two cards to the bottom of the deck, giving you more targets to target, but it has a disadvantage where one, that one requires you to retire one of your rear guards to call two units from your deck, meaning you already have to have a field set up before you can do the superior call skill. While Dragfall lets you just call straight from deck, which is still going to be a plus one regardless. And in many ways, returning two cards doesn't really change much if that's the case because you're going to be, because in many cases, you're basically, you're returning two cards to get two cards back. This one just returned one to get one back. Although, like I said, the advantage of the drag card is that you're returning two, so you got more targets. And of course, you can also activate more abilities on top of it. But the original drag card doesn't have the retire option. And that's what's important because I really like to have a spot removal. Just because pesky rearguards exist. So I prefer playing Dragfall over Dragheart. And keep in mind, since this is a stride based deck, you really want to go second in this deck. Like I said, that's my only grade 3 lineup. Because you don't really need that many grade 3s. As long as you draw the Dragfall, you're good. Or Dragheart if you decide to play it. But now to the grade 2 lineup. First, we start off with the Morian Spear Dragon. So Morian Spear Dragon is a once per turn, Soul Blast 1. You can discard one card from your hand, and it gets plus 5k and draw a card. But if you discard a great one, it gets plus 10k instead. So it could be a big beefy beater, and it can also let you cycle. Now, the thing about why I run Morian Spear, even though it's not that great of ability, is because one of the cards interact with him, which is why I decide to run it. And that other card is... Basically the MVP of the deck, I'm not going to lie. So Maureen Spear is just there to interact with that. And also, the big beefy numbers can be very nice. And then, to continue off, you don't have to run this, but I still like to, because it's a good option. Drag Wizard Leofold, which you can counter blast one on place and then just call grade one from deck. Yep, filter out. That's really good as it is. The only thing is... This deck calls a lot of grade ones really quickly, so in most cases you don't really need to use this, but it's a good card nonetheless to use. Also, for early game purposes too, you can basically help set up if you really are missing key pieces. So it is there, 
but not too necessary based on my experience, but still good nonetheless. And then next, this is entirely up to you, but I really like running this, the Snaptail Dragon. So first off, it has a deck and drop zone ability where if your Vanguard is grade 4 Luard, it becomes a grade 1. That can be very helpful giving you another target out of a, by using a grade 2. So that's nice right there. But the other skill is that Ritual 3, when your grade 1 is called this and that unit gets plus 3k, and this stacks. So it can build up numbers and it can also be counted as your ritual count, which is why I like to run. Now you could run something else like Dark Pride Dragon where it mills the top three, which of course will speed up your count because of course milling more will help speed up your count. But in my experience, I don't really need to run Dark Pride and this actually helps my ritual count and it actually helps out quite a bit. So I like running this. And then finally for my last grade two, I run the Drag Fencer Dangda. Dangda is a generation break one, ritual five. When it attacks, you can counter blast one, retire one of your rear guards, and then call two grade ones from your deck. Yeah, multi-attack, because this is when attack. And one thing Luard is known for is that you have a lot of high power attacks on each of your rear guards as well. So a grade two that enables multi-attack is a must run. And also because it lets you retire one of your rear guards, which can trigger some of your abilities as well. So that's another nice part. So that's it for my grade two lineup. Now to the grade one lineup. First, the MVP of the deck, the blue Espada Dragon. So its skill is that on plays, you can mill the top three cards of your deck. If you have five grade ones, it gets plus 10k. Yep, MVP of the deck lets you mill the top three, thus speeding up your ritual count, and don't mind the triggers too, because they will be counted as your ritual count thanks to one of your cards, and that card is really strong. But, you really just use this for the mill. It's also a grade one and doesn't have the restriction on where on place, meaning that you can technically just call this with Leofold and just mill from there as well. So, it's a searchable mill engine that you really want to run. But you don't want to use this too often as, of course, deck out will be a problem. So, at most, you're going to be using this twice. And then, I run Black Sage Karen, the V version. So, when placed by ability, you can Soul Blast 1 to counter charge 1 and then plus 3k. It's just a counter charge engine that you can use or just do a combo. It's there. You don't really necessarily have to run this, but up to you. Although, although that soul blast does help out sometimes because you could pull the grade one out of the soul. So there's that as well. And then another card that you don't really need to run but I personally like to is the original drag wizard Neves. So ritual when called from deck plus 2k. That does fix some numbers believe it or not for some of your attackers as you're going to be calling a bunch of grade ones and a majority of grade ones are 8k meaning if you're facing a non-force deck that will give you a 17k column in many cases that does fix some numbers so there's that but you mainly use it for the second skill word generation break one at the end of the battle the discard boost you can counter blast one retire the attacking unit and draw a card yes it is a minus one to draw a card but i mainly run this to combo off with dangda because what you can do is that Say you have Dangda on the other column and this is on one column, you can boost that one rear guard column, retire that one rear guard, draw a card. Now you have one open space, Dangda can attack with the other column, retire the Neves, and then call two more grade ones, meaning you don't really waste a card and not force to either. So I just like to do that and you do call Dangda quite often based on my experience. It's there, but it's not necessary. And then I run the original Abyssal Owl. This is basically your Luard Searcher, but except that this is a top seven. And then if you manage to search, you must discard cards total to grade three. That doesn't really matter as in technically you will be building up your drop zone and you kind of want to do that. But also getting your Luard, as long as you got that one Luard in your hand, you're essentially good. That's really all that matters. But the second skill is when retired by ability, ritual counter charge one. So it's just another counter charge engine that you can use. I did run four of these in place of knees, but 
I don't find it too necessary to run for, and it doesn't really come up too often. And then, one of your best Shadow Paladin cards, of course you must run the 4 Nemons, because just by resting it, as a hard once per turn, you can call 5k unit from your deck, which you got a good number of grade ones, and if you run normal triggers, you got that too. But, I'm going to be very honest, since you call so many cards, you're not going to be using Nemon super often. You will use the early game to set some stuff up, but that's about it. And then, I run Abyssal Owl, the V version, so it's 2-2 two, two split. So why I decided to run this Abyssal Owl is because... Its skill is, you can counterblast one to draw a card when it's on place, but you can change it to a soul blast if both players are at the same grade. So, I run this because, yes, you can soul blast, and that does help out sometimes, increasing your drop zone count. And two, it's another 5k unit, so obviously it's a Nemen target. And three, because this is a go second deck, you're very likely going to be able to pull off the soul blast one to draw a card. So... It's there, you can draw early game, which is why I decided to run it. Unlike Blackwing Swordbreaker, you have to only counter blast one and it has to be placed on rear guard, which you will not be able to get the draw early game if you need it. So this just enables more options. And finally, Drag Savior Estrus, the original ritual grade one PG. Why I decided to run it? It's because it's a recyclable PG where the skill is that return a copy of herself to the bottom of the deck and then return one and then retire one of your rear guards and then return a copy of herself back to your hand. It's also searchable, which is why I decide to run these. And of course you do not want to really draw cards in this deck as you're gonna deck out too fast if you decide to run draw triggers. So these are much better. It's recyclable, searchable. That's why I decide to run the ritual one. And then, our starter, I run the V starter because it's a go second deck, so V starters get a plus two, and it's not a delay plus two, and they stay in soul. And in many cases, even running the forerunners, most of them are not that great in Shadow Paladins. Even those that are considered decent, you would still rather use this because it's a plus two compared to just a plus one. That's it for the main normal units, so time to the trigger lineup. First off, I run the Over Trigger, the Cater Sanctuary one. I was thinking about running the Cray Elemental one. And also, I do not have Ultima in this deck because I am not paying $60 on a card. So, instead, Over Trigger it is. So, why I decided to run the Cater Sanctuary one, even though despite I said that deck out can be a problem, is because you're going to get a lot of multi attack out of Dangda, and every card that gets a drive check can be very nasty, so I just decided to run the Cater Sanctuary one, but it's up to you if you want to run the Prey Elemental one, which I am thinking about because you don't want to deck up too fast. But run whatever over tree you want. Anyway, continue off. I run three Stride Fodder Crits. It's there just in case. And then I run the four Put to Soul Draw card. First off, this actually can combo well with Dengda because thanks to the fact that it puts itself to soul, which is also very good. You can you now have an empty column and you don't waste it, so there's also that. And then I run the Benny Owl. So the original Benny Owl has a ritual ability, generation break one. On the drop zone, you can put itself to the bottom of your deck if your vanguard is Luar. That is very nice because you do want recycling and it's a recyclable crit. The only hurtful thing about it is that's an original 5k crit, so that does hurt but you mainly use it for its abilities. And that's one of them, because the second one combos well with your retire options. Because the skill is that when retired by ability, you can draw a card. Which, this plus Neves, and if you use Neves is ritual ability plus 2k, then that'll be a 13k column, and then Neves plus this gives you two draws. So, there's that option, and of course there's other options, like from your strides, many things that you can do with it. You just don't want to really drive check it, you really want to see this more as use for ability and recycling. And then that kind of goes for the same for Curse Eye Raven, because Curse Eye Raven can return itself to the deck and lets you call the top two cards of your deck as rest, which gives you retire fodder. So it's there. Not necessary, but in case of those scenarios where your field is essentially all gone, this can be nice. 
And then, of course, you have to run the four heals. Once heal guardians come out, of course, these will be replaced. So, that's it for the main deck lineup. Now for the G-Zone. So, first off, to start off with the Luard strides, because this is a Luard deck, I'm going to start off with the Drag Abyss Luard. I would run four of these. The only thing is, I do not have four right now. So, why I would run four of these is because of the skills where you can Soul Blast 1, retire one of your rear guards, and then call two great ones from your deck. If both of them were Ritual, you can retire one of your opponent's rear guards. So it's another retire option, but most of the time you're not going to get the Ritual kill, but it's there. But the main skill that you're going to be using often with this is Ritual Cross, where every four great ones in your drop zone, while at Generation Break 3, you can give your whole front row plus 10k power. Yeah, so at the late game, if you have like 12 grade ones at the drop zone, that's 30k power. Yep, very nasty. Which is why I really want to run four of these, but I currently don't have them right now. But obviously run this, and it's very generic for any Shadow Paladin deck as well. Because you don't really need to use this for a Ritual deck, so that's why they're getting quite expensive. But overall, you should run four of these in this deck. Next for a card that you don't necessarily need to run, but I personally like to, is Drag Strider Luar, the breaking his limit form, his true dragon form. So his only skill is Generation Break 2, Ritual 7, retire two of your rear guards, and then discard as many cards as you want from your hand. For every card you discard, plus 3k, if you discard at least two, plus one crit, drag plus one, and your opponent cannot guard with any card that is grade one or higher from their hand. So it's basically the old Sentinel Guard Restrict back in the day. Yes, people don't really want run Grade 1 PGs anymore, but for decks that do, this can be good counter to them. And also because it's pretty much no counter blast and no soul blast, and creating a field presence isn't really hard in this deck. So if you don't have any other good options, this can be a good one. It's there, yes, you do have to discard two cards, which could have been your kill fodder, but... I'm just saying, against those decks that still use grade 1 PGs, this can be nice. And then to that one stride that I pretty much stride for this deck, and you might just call this the Morfessa deck, I run 3 Drag Principle Morfessa. So the skill of it is you can counter blast 1, retire 2 of your rear guards, draw 2 cards, and then for the rest of the turn, your trigger units are counted as your ritual count. Yeah. That's why Blue is Spotted Dragon's Milling Trigger is no problem because even if you mill a trigger, it counts part as your Ritual count for this. Which lets me pull off her Ritual 10 skill, which is her second skill, within the first stride usually, where all your front row units get plus 15k power, one crit, and your opponent must guard with at least two cards from their hand for each attack. Yeah, I pull this off in first stride because of Blue is Spotted Dragon milling the deck super quickly and it doesn't matter if you mill triggers because of the first skill letting you count your trigger units as part of your ritual count and even if you do not really get your ritual 10 right away on first stride well you got ways to search your blue spotted dragon out which can mill another top three and you have a very likely chance that you're going to be getting a trigger plus a grade one which is usually average two out of the three cards so yes, that Ritual 10 count isn't even hard. And keep in mind, you're retiring two more rear guards too, which could be two more grade ones. So this is basically the main MVP and basically your big finisher as well. It gives your opponent a lot to think about with the pressure, especially when you combo it with Dangda. And that goes with the same with Drag Abyss because you're you're going to have really high power attacks. But with Morfessa, they also have a crit. So they're at four damage, four attacks with crits each. Whew, that's going to be very nasty, especially with them needing to use at least two cards for each. And then for the last Drag Wizard card, I decide to run Drag Anger Orgma. Its skill is uh, kind of last one, soul last one, choose a card from your G-Zone, turn it face up, retire as many grade ones or less as you want, and then your opponent chooses the same number of cards as the number of your retired cards, and send them to the drop zone from their field and hand. So against those decks that decide to lose their field, well, your opponent's going to be discarding quite a bit from their hand because if you retire five rear guards, which generating those rear guards are not even hard, your opponent loses five cards. Yeah, that could be nasty. So it depends on certain matchups. 
And if you retire at least four cards, well, you draw a card as well. So you do get something back out of it, but this is only here to screw over those decks that doesn't have a field presence. And then for the last of my strides, I run the Phantom Blaster Diablo because, well, it's just good. You can counter boss one just to flip and copy of itself plus 10k one crit. And then it gets the skill where you can retire three of your rear guards when it attacks, and then your opponent must choose two of them and retire them, but they cannot retire two. Well, they can't guard the attack, which against a Gizeh matchup, that's going to be nasty. And then this is my alternate to Drag Abyss at the moment, which is Cleric Sword Helheim. I'm going to be very honest right now, you're most likely not going to be able to get to this too often because of his skill where... When this card attack hits, or when your opponent uses a G guard or Sentinel to guard the attack, you can flip a copy of himself face up and then for every face up card in your G zone, you can call Great One from your deck. So basically it gets stronger as the game goes on. Now like I said before, since you run through your deck really fast, you're probably not going to have too many targets for this. So I personally would replace these two for Drag Abyss, but right now I don't have my other two Drag Abyss yet. So right now I'm running Cleric Sword Hellheim, which is still pretty decent, especially when your opponent's at 5 damage, where they're essentially forced to guard. But you can technically use this early game too when your G zone is kind of set up. If you really need a field present and all that, it's there too. And then to the G Guardians, first off I run Jalito, because Jalito is the flip G guard and then lets you use two cards as from your rear guards as guardians and in some cases you do want to do that because you want to clear up your field so you can activate more skills so it does help actually and because there are a lot of on place grade ones so that's another reason why you want to clear them and if you're using v grade ones well they're 10k shield each so this plus that that's another 20k shield plus right there so you have that option and then i run Arc, which when used as G Guardian, you can look at the top card cards of your deck and then use every grade 1 from among them as Guardians. And like I said, your V grade 1s are going to be 10k shield, so that does add up. And also, it increases your ritual count, so it's here just in case, as usually this will be your first G Guardian if you need to use it. But in cases that you don't, it's there. But increasing your drop zone count of grade 1s, very helpful. And then... Dark Veil Dragon, this is a late game G guard where you can Soul Blast 1 for every 2 great ones from your drop zone, plus 5k shield. So it's there for late game purposes. And then finally, the Plot Maker Dragon, which just by Ritual 3 it gets plus 10k shield. Which 25k shield is pretty good, even if it's 5k more than the heal trigger, that extra 5k can make a difference. And also with heal guardians coming up, which are also grade 3s that could be used as stride fodders. Well, they're going to be 15k shield, so getting an extra 10k shield for that purpose is also good as well. So that's it for this deck profile. What do you guys think of it? Personally, I had fun with this deck. And considering that Luard is one of those decks that you can experiment with your lineup, you can play test a lot of things with this deck. The only thing is probably your G zone lineup and you're going to be honestly striding Morfessa a lot. And also that ban of Bendy for premium kind of hurt me because I played Phantom Blaster Dragon premium. So that was unfortunate, but at least I got a good alternative in the form of Luard and I've been very tempted to build Luard for a very long time. The only thing is that Luard was kind of expensive, at least until we got Revival Collection where most of the cards were getting reprinted. So I was very happy for that. And with that premium ban list, I kind of go like, eh, screw it, just build Luard now. So go ahead and tell me below what you guys think of it. And also, tell me what other alternate cards might be good for the deck. I did suggest the Dark Pride Dragon that you could run in your Grade 2 lineup because it does the same as Blue as Spotted Dragon, so you have like two different cards like a mill. And I have thought about cutting the two Leo Folds for more Morian Spears because the Leo Fold isn't too necessary most of the time. Or even in some cases, you could even replace the Snaptail Dragon as you kind of build up your drop zone count pretty quickly, although I do like the Snaptail counting as Grade 1. So many options that you can pick from there and of course there's a lot of good child power and grade ones that you can also run 
And another option you can do is run some 5k power triggers just for more Nemin targets, but like I said, I don't really need to use Nemin skill too often considering that you're calling a bunch of grade ones. And also that alternate where you can use Dragheart Luard as your main vanguard just for the drag ship of returning two cards from your drops onto your deck is also there if you like to do that. But like I said before, I like to run Dragfall because it has a retire option. But other than that, that's it for this. And have a nice day and transform yourself into a dragon.